So y'all awake this morning? <laughs> yeah, it's different. I, mean, I woke up at 6 o'clock this morning, and I'm like, it's still dark outside. It's middle of the night. Now, you guys did mess up by waiting and come to second service because my granddaughter was at first service, so you missed that. But I'm glad you're here this morning. Uh, well, let's get started. Who knows what the talk is in a dating relationship? Some of you may know it as the DTR, the define the relationship. Let me give you a hint. Uh, if you're a young man, this talk may strike fear into your heart. Some guys will do anything to avoid the talk. They will uh, buy flowers. They will change the subject. They'll run screaming from the room. They may even end the relationship to avoid the talk. Well, the talk or the DTR is that moment in every dating relationship, if it goes long enough, where you will stop and talk about where the relationship is headed, what, where, where we at and where are we going from here. And I remember uh, when I was a senior in high school, I would asked this 11th grader out on a first date, and the date was going great. We went to the fanciest restaurant in my little hometown, also known as the Pizzeria, and we went back to her house and talked to her parents, because I knew her parents, because everybody knew everybody. And then we went into the living room, and we watched a movie. And things are going awesome until she walked me out to the car. We got to the car, and she's talking to me a minute, and then she says, I just want you to know that I love you, and I have for a really long time. I don't know why she said it. I mean, you know, in fairness, I do have that effect on women, and I didn't know that she wanted to go out with me. But, like, I don't know why she said it. Maybe she wanted to get rid of me. And if that's what she wanted, man, it worked. You've seen that movie, How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days? You know, this was How to Lose a Guy in 10 Seconds. I was not ready to define the relationship on our first date, and I did not handle it well. I just literally went, oh, okay, okay. well, see ya, <laughs> got in my car and drove off. And then I also never asked her out again. I tried to avoid her at school for several weeks, and the worst thing I did in hindsight was I told all my friends what had happened, and because it was a small town, I'm sure that it got back to her. But I was not ready to define the relationship on the first date. But I remember the talks very differently with my wife, Lil, when we were dating in college. I was excited about the talks because I wanted our relationship to move to more committed levels, and I was excited about what the next step must look like, and so it was fun to talk about in those moments. And what it comes down to is how you view the talk very much comes down to how you view the relationship. If the person is someone you love and you're ready to move to deeper levels of love and commitment, you're excited about the talk. But if you're just having a casual good time, you'll do anything you can to avoid the talk. And today, I'm asking for you to have the talk with Jesus. Now look, some of you guys are kind of on a first date you, maybe you've not been in church very long and you don't really even know if you believe what we're talking about here or maybe you hadn't been in church in a long time and it's a little early for you to define the relationship. But for most of us, it's time for the talk. And, and some of you guys are excited about that because you're, you're excited about moving to the next phase of your connection to Jesus and moving to deeper levels of commitment. But some of you just got a little uncomfortable because you kind of like the way things are. You kind of like this kind of casual relationship where there's no strings attached. And, and so you're a little reluctant to have the talk with Jesus because if you're honest, it makes you a little uncomfortable. Well, if you have your Bibles, your Bible apps, go ahead and open those up to John chapter 15. We are in a series called Death to Life where we are looking at some of the very last teachings of Jesus before he went to the cross. And so at this point of the teaching for today, they've already had what we call the Lord's Supper or the Last Supper where Jesus celebrated the Passover with his disciples. Uh, Judas has already left to betray Jesus to the religious leaders. And after dinner, they go for an evening walk. And they'd probably done this many times where they walk with Jesus and talk. But this one would be different because they would end at a place called the Garden of Gethsemane. And that's where Jesus would be arrested. So we're just a few hours from the cross. But as they're walking and the sun's beginning to set, they go through a vineyard. And Jesus sees the opportunity for an illustration. And so he looks over at a grapevine and he says these words to teach his apostles. Here's what he says in John 15, 1 through 8. I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. 
while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you're like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. So what's interesting about this illustration uh, is that Jesus calls himself the true vine. Now, this would have been very different to his apostles because in the Old Testament, Jesus, uh, God called Israel the vine and said they bore no fruit. And now Jesus is saying, I'm the true vine. So I'm sure the apostles were like, I thought, thought, thought we were the vine. But Jesus says, I am the true vine and you're the branches. If you remain in me, you'll, connect, you'll, be, you'll produce fruit. Now, keep in mind here that they're walking to the place where Jesus is going to be arrested. So everything is about to change. This is one of the last moments Jesus has to really talk to his apostles. Remember, these are the guys that are going to lead the church when Jesus rises from the dead and returns to heaven. These are the guys that are going to spread the gospel throughout the world. And in this last moment, you can call this the last team meeting, what Jesus doesn't say, he doesn't say, look, guys, I'm about to leave you, so we got to get all of our organizational charts together. we got to get your job descriptions worked out. We've got to work on a five-year plan. He doesn't even say, guys, we've got a really big mission ahead, and so we need to make sure that your areas of responsibility are defined. Instead, he reminds them of who they are. He says he is the true vine, and they're branches, and everything flows out of that connection to Jesus. But remember, out of that connection to the vine, these guys did produce a lot of fruit. These guys changed the world. And if I'm honest, this idea of connection is kind of hard for me because I have really a get or done attitude. I mean, the way I lead, the way I, I work is, and I just want to knock one thing out, move to the next thing. And so sometimes I think I can make a closer connection to Jesus by doing some church work. If I plan some events or if I work on a sermon, that I am growing my relationship with Jesus. And, and there is some truth. I can do that and I do that. But I've realized that my primary connection is to the vine. And so, as I've told you before, over the last several weeks or a couple of months, I've been praying in a different way than I've prayed before. I wake up in the middle of the night and pray. I have been praying with more desperation and passion. I'm praying more often than I did. And our staff is praying in a different way and praying more often. Because we realize that before we can accomplish a mission, we've got to be connected to the vine. We want to be a people who are desperate for God. And, and I think so often the church, and I'm not just talking about this church, I'm talking about churches in general, we tend to fight, focus on production rather than connection, right? We talk about what you need to accomplish. You need to give generously back to the church. You need to serve. You need to share your faith. You need to invite people to church. You need to live holy lives. And then we tell you, oh, you need to have peace. You need to have joy even in difficult circumstances. You need to have hope when you feel hopeless. All of these different things are what flows out of the connection. But I don't think we focus nearly enough on our connection. Because the more connected you are, the more connected, the more likely you are to do these things because you have a relationship that's deepening. You're going to have a heart to give generously because you want to honor God with your finances. You're going to share your faith and live holy lives because his priorities have become passions for you. It's important for you now. You're going to want to live holy lives to bring glory and honor to Jesus because that relationship is important to you. The more you connect to the vine, the more your production will come out of that. And you'll find that you'll find peace and joy and all those things we talk about. Because the power for life change comes out of our connection to the true vine. And look, I know that we're all kind of in different places with our connection to Jesus. I mean, some of you guys aren't sure you even believe what we're talking about yet. And so you've never really connected to the vine at all. And some of you guys, you've decided to follow Jesus. You've made a decision but you've never really moved from decided to disciples. You, you made a decision, but then you've grown stagnant and nothing's really changed. You've never moved forward. 
being a follower of Jesus doesn't really define who you are. You you don't have a a passion to pray and study the Bible because you've kind of got this no strings attached, kind of casual relationship with Jesus. You don't give generously back to God at church because, I mean, it's your money. It's not God's money. And and you're not really trying to grow in your relationship because it's just not that important. You kind of like the way things are. And you don't really invite people to church or serve because God's priorities have never really become your passions. And and look, this isn't new. (laughs) Jesus always had lots of people that would hang around for a little while. They would enjoy the, the teaching. They would love the miracles. They'd like getting fed. But they never really were changed by meeting Jesus. And what we see in the Bible is that Jesus really didn't have much of a desire to have that relationship. He didn't care too much about having lots of people around him. He didn't care too much about having casual relationships. He wanted committed followers. And and so what we see from Jesus in those moments is there'd be this big crowd gathered around, and then Jesus would all of a sudden start teaching some really hard teaching, and you'd watch the crowd disappear where only a few people remain. We see that as an example in Luke chapter 14. This big crowd was following Jesus, and Jesus suddenly turned around and just said to them, if you want to follow me, you got to hate your father and mother. Well, just imagine how that struck the crowd. There there had to be easier ways to say that. What he's really trying to say is, if you want to follow me, you got to love me more than everybody else. But he said it harshly because he didn't want to make following him easy. He wasn't interested in casual relationships. He wanted committed followers. He wanted disciples who are growing in their connection to the vine. Another example of that is he had a crowd and he suddenly said, if you want to follow me, you got to consume my flesh. you got to eat my flesh. Well, that got uncomfortable all of a sudden and people like ran like rats off a ship. And I'm sure the apostles were like, Jesus, dude. And if you could kind of avoid the eat my flesh, drink my blood kind of analogies, that would be awesome. You know, we got a high attendance Sunday coming up next week, and you're kind of hurting the numbers, Jesus. But what we see is Jesus wasn't interested in having a lot of casual relationships. He wanted committed followers. Some of you, you like coming to church as long as it's nice outside and you don't have anything better to do. You don't even mind being challenged on occasion because it's good to have some tough teaching where you grow in your marriage or you learn to find joy and peace in some difficult circumstances. And you'd love that your kids are learning to to chase after something that's bigger than themselves. But you get a little uncomfortable when things go too far or we ask too much. I mean, mean, you've got a Bible. I mean, you don't ever really read it, but you got it. And, And you pray. But, but it's usually when you need something from God, not in growing a relationship. And, and yeah, you, you love Jesus, but that shouldn't really affect how you act at work or with your friends or how you treat your wife or your husband. You, you love Jesus, but you don't want to hear talk about God's design for marriage. You don't want to hear how you're supposed to not have sex until you're married because that's your life and nobody needs to butt into that. It's not anybody's business but yours. And you don't want to give generously back to God because, well, that's your money. It's not God's money. We're Christians as long as it doesn't inconvenience us too much. We want a no-strings-attached relationship with Jesus. We want to follow closely enough that we get all the benefits of the relationship, but none of the responsibilities. But here's the difficult truth. Jesus isn't really interested in a casual no strings attached relationship. That's not what he's looking for. And so Jesus is saying, let's define the relationship. How closely are you connected to the vine? And and I think if I'm honest, some of this was created by the modern church. I think the American church has done this. What we've done in modern churches is we've created this big group of people that all gathered together and they've decided to be there, but they're not discipled. They're not growing in their faith. And that's in part because We've watered down Jesus' message. Jesus' message is come die to yourself, deny yourself. And we've watered that down to come satisfy yourself. Come find personal happiness. Come find personal commitment and contentment. We've made it all about us. We focus so much on the benefits of salvation and so little on the obligations of what it means to be a follower. We talk about this eternal life that Jesus is offering. And that's true. That is, eternal life is what he's offering. But if you look at it, life never really happens except through death 
in every circumstance of finding this life we seek, it's through death. Look at Romans 6, 3 through 4 and see how Paul says this. He says, or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. You see this idea of dying to yourself and then living in Jesus. We separate salvation from surrender, but it doesn't work that way. Here's the upside down, crazy message of following Jesus. If you're looking to find this abundant life that we talked about last week, you only find it by denying yourself, by dying to yourself. It's only when we deny ourselves that we finally find the real life that we've been looking for all along. There's a book called Raving Fans by a guy named Clint Blanchard. And, and this book talks all about how businesses can turn their customers into fans. And it says the way you do that is you make the customer feel very important. You make them very happy. And you make your product convenient and accessible. If you haven't figured it out, Apple Corporation does a pretty nice job of that. And, and that makes perfect sense for businesses but the problem is the American church has kind of started to do the same thing. We kind of view people as customers. And so when you show up, we kind of show you around the store and show you all the products that we sell. In fact, we've even started calling, looking for a church home, church shopping. And so when we show you around the store, we talk about, oh, here's what we have for your kids. And here's what we have for your students. And here are all of our convenient service times. And look, that's important. We want to give opportunities for your family to grow in their relationship with Jesus. But the problem becomes we've made it all about us rather than about Jesus. And the problem is that what we win you with, comfort and convenience, becomes what we win you to. And that's then what you expect. And see, we try to make following Jesus as easy as we can, and then we measure our success by how many customers that we have. But that's not how Jesus did it. And if we're going to teach the way Jesus taught, we see that he wasn't interested in a lot of people just hanging around. And at some point, we have to decide where this relationship is headed. We have to define the relationship and decide how strong is our connection to the vine. Like, I know that sermons like this don't grow big churches. It makes you a little uncomfortable when you hear it. it. It doesn't give you a warm, fuzzy feeling about your church experience. And quite frankly, it makes you kind of question where you are in your relationship with Jesus. But that's what Jesus did. And here's why I'm doing it. Because more than having a big church with lots of people, I want you to find this relationship that Jesus wants with you where you find abundant life out of this relationship, where you become part of his mission. You find purpose in being a part of his mission to transform the world. I, I want you to find joy even in difficulty. I want you to find peace even in loss, to find purpose even in suffering. When you have a strong connection to the vine, that's what you get. You get this abundant life. And let's be honest. Some of you have never really experienced that. You, you've kind of hung out at Decided and never really moved to Discipled, and so you've never felt this kind of life that Jesus is talking about. Others of you, there was a point in your life when you were really growing in your relationship, when you were connecting and being discipled to the vine. But then something happened, maybe it was a few months ago, maybe it was several years ago, something happened and suddenly all of that changed, and so your relationship kind of deteriorated and it became a very cool relationship uh, with Jesus, and <clears throat> you're not as connected as you once were. Look back at verses 5 through 6. Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you're like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. So Jesus is saying, if you're connected to me, you'll produce lots of fruit. If you're not connected, you really can't do anything. But then he says this teaching that kind of feels a little uncomfortable. He, he says, if you don't stay connected to the vine, you're just like a branch that falls off a tree or a vine, and it dies. And at that point, it's, it's not good for anything except to start a fire. I grew up in rural northeast Texas, and so over the years, I picked up a lot of sticks and started a lot of fires. I mean, everything from little cooking fires, campfires, fires in fireplaces to big, huge bonfires. 
And what I never did that I can remember is ever like try to pull branches off live trees. Instead, what I would do is I would walk around and pick up dead branches that have become sticks and use those as kindling for firewood. That's what Jesus is talking about here. When, when a branch falls off the tree, it no longer produces fruit. It, it, it dies based on its lack of connection. And it's now just a stick that's not good for anything except kindling for the fire. And, and some of you guys, if you're honest, that's kind of where you are. You're, you're kind of sticks. Maybe you've tied the little fake fruit on the end to kind of wave it around. You show up for church every once in a while and hope pe- people think that you're still a branch. You're just faking it. I, I remember growing up, and my mom had this really old antique wooden basket, and she kept fruit in it. And at first, she would put live fruit in it, and it would die, and she'd have to replace it, and it'd start stinking and get bugs crawling all over it. So eventually, she put fake fruit in it. And, you know, I guess at a distance, it looked like fruit. And, but when you got up close, you could see that it was plastic. And it certainly didn't taste like fruit. It smelled and tasted like plastic. I'm not going to tell you how I know that, but I do. And some of you guys, that's where you are. You're just sticks with some fake fruit tied on for show. You're just hoping that if you come to church on occasion that people will think you're a branch. But if you're honest, your relationship with Jesus at this point is pretty non-existent. Listen to what God says about this kind of relationship in Isaiah 29, 13. He says, the Lord says, These people come near to me with your mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is based on merely human rules they've been taught. You come to church because you know that's what you're supposed to do, but you're not honoring God in your heart. You're not honoring him with your life. You just do what you were taught to do. You're just a stick pretending to be a branch. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but if sticks could talk, they'd probably tell you a story about how they went from being a branch connected to a tree or a vine. Make for a really weird dream if sticks started talking to you. But if they could talk, they could tell you about how they were once a branch that was connected to the vine producing fruit, and then something happened that changed all that, and they became disconnected from the tree or the vine, and they became a stick. And I think one way that branches become sticks is through a storm. I don't know if you've ever driven around after a tropical storm or a a hurricane comes through the Katy area, but after that happens, there are a lot of new sticks. I love to drive around in my truck after a storm and kind of, you know, blow through some of the water and uh, feel like I've got a big truck, you know, sort of, and I'll see all the damage that's, that's taken place and see if I can help. And I'll see a lot of new sticks. There'll be all these big branches laying in the street. And they were, they were branches just the day before the storm, but now they're sticks. And so people, after the storm, they'll gather all the, the, the sticks up and they'll pile them by the street for somebody to carry off. Or if you live out in the country, you'll just go ahead and pile those up and burn them because that's what they're good for. N- nobody takes a stick and tries to connect it back to the tree because that's no longer what they're good for. You know, after a storm, there are still branches that are connected to the trees producing fruit. But there are also a lot of new sticks. And storms have a way of revealing the strength of the connection between the tree or the vine and the branches. And the same is true for us in our relationship with Jesus. Storms have a way of revealing the strength of our connection to Jesus. When we go through storms or difficulties in life, People react different ways. Some Christians will draw even closer to Jesus. Their relationship will be strengthened through that suffering. Others will be disillusioned and disappointed, and they'll find that their relationship with Jesus begins to to weaken, and eventually they become sticks. They become disconnected from the vine. And I think one of the things that happens so often that becomes a storm that causes us to disconnect is what we'll call church hurt. A lot of you have been hurt by a church at some point. Maybe that was when you were a kid. It's been years ago, but the church had a very harsh attitude about things, and so they didn't treat you very well if you struggled with sin, or they they hurt somebody that you care about because they had a very harsh, no-compassion kind of approach, and you've never really gotten over that hurt from the church. Uh, Some people have been hurt by the, the modern church, I think some churches have become really connected to a particular political party or to a particular candidate. And you may have been hurt by a church because you felt like if you don't vote a certain way or you don't follow a particular candidate that you're not really following Jesus. 
And, and churches have become divided over how to deal with some different issues in our culture. How do we respond to racism in our community? How do we deal with cultural sin around us? And, and maybe you've been disappointed by the way a church has responded to some of these issues. Or maybe you've just become disappointed with the way you feel the evangelical church in general has responded to some of these various things. And it's caused you to be disconnected to the church. And the reality is this. The church bears a lot of responsibility for branches becoming sticks. We do. And if you've been hurt by a church, look, I'm not the spokesman for the big C church, but I want to say I'm sorry. That, that's not how the bride of Christ should be. We should be showing grace that draws people to Jesus, not pushes them away. And I want to say I'm sorry that that's happened. But I also want to challenge you a little bit. What I think happened is your connection was to the wrong thing. See, you became connected to a church, and maybe your connection was to that church or to a particular preacher, and that preacher disappointed you with something that he did or said, or that church hurt you by the way they acted. And because of that, you became disconnected. But the problem is your connection shouldn't be to the church or to the preacher. Your connection is to Jesus. That's the true first connection. Because then if a church hurts you and they just do something wrong or a preacher says something or does something wrong, your connection with Jesus isn't broken because Jesus didn't do it. Imperfect people did it. And so I would tell you, your primary connection shouldn't be to me. Your primary connection shouldn't be to Chris. Your primary connection shouldn't even be to Karis City Church. Your primary connection is to Jesus. But the reality is that storms can cause us to be disconnected. And there are lots of other storms that can cause us to, to weaken and go from being a, a branch to a stick. Maybe that's a health struggle. You've been struggling with something or somebody you care about has been struggling with a health problem and you've prayed desperately to God to be healed. You, you want him to fix your circumstances, and so far, he hasn't answered your prayer the way you thought he would. Maybe it's a bad marriage, or you've gone through a divorce, and that storm has caused you to go from being a branch to a stick. It's caused your relationship with Jesus to weaken. Maybe that's a struggle you've had with one of your kids, and God just won't change the circumstances, and so you become disconnected to the vine. Some of you may have been disconnected by COVID-19. Seems like that storm was a while ago. But, you know, what happened is churches began to do remote services and we didn't gather. And, and you may have started gathering remotely and watching church on TV all the way back during that time period in COVID-19. But what you found is as churches regathered, you're, you're still just kind of watching from home and you're not part of the church. But if you're honest with yourself, your connection with the church is now gone. But what you've also seen is your connection to Jesus has also weakened as well. Storms can cause us to be disconnected from the vine. Another way that branches go from branches to becoming sticks is disease. Maybe it's an insect infestation or some kind of fungus or mold, and slowly over time, a branch that's producing fruit slowly begins to rot, and eventually it'll stop producing fruit, and it'll fall from the vine and go from being a branch to a stick. And this can happen to us with sin. We have sin in our lives that, if we're honest, we like the sin. And in some ways, we're, we choose that sin over our relationship with Jesus. And over time, that sin begins to rot our heart. It begins to disconnect us from the vine. The first thing it does is it stops your production. But eventually, it will actually damage or destroy your relationship with Jesus. Now, I'm not talking about just a sin. We all sin. We all mess up. But I'm not talking about... You sin, you repent, and you move forward. I'm talking about living in sin, where you know that something is a sin. But that sin is so important to you that you choose that sin over your relationship with Jesus, even though you know what it's doing. Eventually, it'll cause you to not be productive, and eventually it will destroy your relationship. Author Philip Yancey, he tells about a story where a friend of his had invited him to go have coffee one morning. And as he sits down to have coffee... This friend just abruptly says, I'm leaving my wife. He says he'd been married for 15 years, and he said, look, there's really nothing wrong with my marriage. It's not bad, but I'm ready for some excitement. I'm, I'm ready for something new. He'd found someone younger and prettier. And so he was ready to move on from his wife. And he told Yancey, he said, I know it's a sin. But then he asked Yancey this difficult question. 
He says, so after I divorce my wife and I marry this new woman, will God forgive me for what I've done? And Yancey said he paused and didn't answer the question immediately. He took a few sips of his coffee. And he said, if you're asking me whether or not God will forgive you for what you've done, the answer is yes. But you're not asking the right question. Here's the right question. Will you even care? And here's the point that Yancey was making. He was not saying that God will kick us out because of our sin, but what he is saying that at some point, sin becomes such a disease in our heart that we're no longer interested in a connection to the vine. And Yancey tells the the end of this story. He says that this friend of his went on and made the decision, left his wife, wound up leaving all his friends, left his church, left everything he knew, and eventually he left Jesus behind and never looked back. And Jesus let him go. Some of you know what I'm talking about. You've got an area of sin that is tearing up your life. It's destroying relationships. And and you won't let it go. You know it's wrong. But if you're really honest, you love that particular sin more than you love your relationship with Jesus. And slowly but surely, that sin is destroying your relationship. Just like Yancey's friend. Maybe you've been stuck in this sin for a long time, and at this point, your relationship with God is kind of on life support. Maybe it's dead where it feels like it can never be restored. You become separated from the true vine. Listen to what Isaiah says in Isaiah 59, 2, about how this happens. But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear He doesn't kick us out. He doesn't disconnect us. We become disconnected by the disease of our heart. We should hate the sin in our lives because we know what it does to our relationship with Jesus. It separates us from God, and eventually it will cause us to go from being a branch to just being a stick, separated from the true vine. Sticks are dead branches, and nobody puts sticks back on vines except Jesus Jesus is in the business of taking dead things and bringing them back to life. Jesus is in the business of taking things that are broken and ugly and restoring them and making them more beautiful than ever before. He is in the business of making things new and and different. We know that Jesus raised three different people from the dead, at least three different people that the Bible talks about during his ministry. And we know that Jesus came back from the dead. We celebrate that every Sunday, but we're going to celebrate it here in three weeks on Resurrection Sunday. Have you ever read about the process of of grafting? Have you ever read much about that? Grafting is where a gardener takes a stick and he reconnects it to the vine or to the tree. And the way he'll do that is he'll take a stick and he'll cut a notch out of the vine. So he'll cut this V-shaped notch out of the vine, and then he'll take this stick, and he'll connect it to the vine, and then he'll seal it with wax. And eventually, that stick will start to take nutrients, and eventually it'll start to produce fruit. Do you know what the process of cutting that V-shaped notch in the vine is called? It's called bleeding. You bleed the vine. So through the bleeding of the vine, a stick eventually becomes a branch and starts to produce fruit again. God the Father is the gardener, and he allowed the true vine, Jesus, to bleed so that we could go from being sticks to being branches. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him won't perish but have everlasting life. Look, I don't know where you're at in your relationship with Jesus. Maybe you're a stick with a sad story about how you become disconnected from the vine. Jesus died so that you can be a branch again. And that's true whether your connection with Jesus is just a little dead or it feels so dead that it can never be repaired. Jesus bled for sticks so they can become branches. Jesus moves us from death to life. Maybe you've never decided to follow Jesus. Maybe you don't even know what that looks like. You need to know that Jesus loves you so much that he bled and died so that you could find life. Here's the beautiful reality of the good news of Jesus Christ. We're all in this together. We're all just sticks that became branches because the true vine bled and died for us on the cross. 
So, so let me ask you a question. Where are you in your relationship with Jesus? Are you being discipled? Are you growing? Or are you just stuck and decided? How you answer that question will define the fullness that you experience in this life. But it can also affect eternity for you or the people around you because you're not showing the fruit that you're supposed to show. Jesus isn't calling you to come to church. He's calling you to be the church, to be part of this incredible mission to transform the world around us. He he wants you to have a passion to grow in relationship to him, to be transformed by him. He wants you to love him more than your hobbies, your habits, and your money. How strong is your connection to the vine? And here's the good news for you. No matter where you're at, Jesus turns death into life. Let's pray.